Hello, everyone. Does that work well? <laughs> it's so lovely to be here. Thank you so much. I'm Natalie Rudd, and I um, produced the Breaking the Mould exhibition uh, with the help of many people and the Arts Council Collection team. And I no longer work for the Arts Council Collection, so my comments this evening are, as a, as a freelance curator, really, and writer, um, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Alice Channer and Rana Begum. It's just brilliant that you could be with us tonight and to share your thoughts on your practice and on, on the exhibition as a whole. But I'm also really grateful to all the team here at Walsall who have put together this brilliantly beautiful rendition of Breaking the Mould. It's a wonderful finale for the exhibition. I think it looks just really fresh and crisp in the galleries and it's just so inspiring to see it looking wonderful on its last outing. And I'd like to thank Stephen Snoddy, the director, Deborah, Hannah, Kevin, all the team here who I know have um, done everything to make the show really special. But I do have a very special thanks to Zoe Carlon, who my old colleague from the Arts Council collection team, who has installed this show all across the UK. I think, is it three, four, five times? Have you been to everyone now? <laughs> everyone. And it's really um, done a brilliant job in working really closely with me with the exhibition, but also running with it ever since. So thank you so much, Zoe, I did want to thank you. Um, and it's the final week of the exhibition, and it's been going on for quite a long time. And the first mention of an exhibition about women working in sculpture was in 2016, so seven years ago now. And that was when Hilary Gresty and Carol, uh, Catherine George came to speak with me. I don't know if you were there, Zoe, but they came to speak with us about these interviews they've been doing with artists working in sculpture. And they said, well, what about an exhibition from the Arts Council collection? And I immediately thought it would be a really wonderful idea. And since then, the show has toured to five partner venues. And I say partner because it has been a true collaboration with venues, thinking not just about how the show would work at each place, but also talking very much from the very start about how we would curate the exhibition, what the themes would be, how we would conceive this incredibly rich project. And so the show launched at Longside Gallery at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. It's been to the Genogli Gallery at Nottingham University to the box in Plymouth, and it's wonderful that the curators from the box are here this evening, and the Lubinsky Gallery in Plymouth, Ferrens Art Gallery in Hull, and finally here at Walsall. So it's been a thoroughly national tour, and the show's been seen by over 40,000 people, and that's before it got to Walsall. And so it's been a journey of different installations, different places, different responses, and a really wide engagement program and learning program, and my thanks to La La from the Arts Council Collection for continuing this great work. But what's really struck me, and I've, I've curated quite a few shows from the Arts Council Collection, is the incredible warmth that surrounds this project. I think I felt quite a lot of fear about launching this show. It felt like a really important thing to do, but also quite a scary thing to do to produce an exhibition around gender uh, as its starting point. But it's been a kind of building conversation across venues, and, and, and it's just been so lovely to work on a show that's been met with such warmth. And since the show launched in 2021, after being postponed due to COVID, there's been many other artistic developments, there have been other exhibitions, there's been more art history, more publishing around women working in sculpture, and it's felt really exciting to produce a show that has helped con contribute to such a rich seam of investigation. And I think it's important to stress that the show is a conversation. It's meant to be playful. It's meant to open, open up practices that perhaps may be less familiar than others. Um, and we were aware of the sensitivities of curating an exhibition on the basis of gender. But overall, we wanted to create an open, inclusive space and to start a conversation. And so on that basis, it feels really apt to wrap this tour with a conversation with two artists whose work is represented in the Arts Council collection, but also in this exhibition. And both Alice and Rana have achieved significant international recognition for their art, working across materials, forms, sites, and contexts. And I think it's just a brilliant opportunity 
to invite Rana and Alice to begin this evening by giving a sort of short introduction to their practice so that we can hear firsthand the motivations and stimulations behind the work. And then we're going to break out into a conversation. And I've come up with some questions. I think there's lots that we could talk about this evening. But to try and think about areas of crossover and connection, but also areas of contrast, but also to keep in mind the exhibition downstairs and to think about this work in relation to this broader conversation. And there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. So I'd be really grateful if everyone could get their thinking caps on and think about things that you might like to ask the artists this evening. So I'm going to pass across to Rana Begum. Rana, welcome and thank you so much. So I thought actually I would show a few slides that um, kind of represents a uh, body of work that I'm exploring at the moment. So there's different series and it's, um, you know, the work here in the show is a series of work that I've been developing since I would say 2010, I think. And um, that body of work has had an impact on the other series that are happening in the studio. So it's a series that I'm still continuing to explore, continuing to push and um, look at materials, look at the way I use paint, look at the way that the form kind of shifts and um, works with color and light. Um, so this is a piece of work that is part of the Dappled Light show that's been touring. Um, and it's actually going to be um, on its last iteration at the box uh, very soon. And um, this is kind of using um, a material that's kind of, it's powder coated uh, wire mesh, which is then um, powder coated flat and then kind of formed after it's colored. And within each of these forms, there's another form inside. And so that kind of really, um, it's looking at kind of color and depth and uh, form and how light kind of plays with this um, installation. Um, this is a series that actually started off um, from uh, these kind of paintings that I started in the studio. They're called kind of spot paintings, that, just as a reference. So all of my works are numbered. They don't, they're not titled um, uh, to kind of represent anything. They're, they're titled and they have a reference. So this series of work is kind of, it would be a number and then it would be mesh. Um, and that's just as a reference for me. Um, so this body of work stemmed from uh, spot paintings that I was um, doing. Uh, initially, they kind of came up as, as kind of accidents. Um, and they were kind of tests for bar pieces that we were spraying. And every time we sprayed these works, we had to test the consistency, the flow, and the color. And so we were testing it on this pieces of paper. And over time, I kept like looking at this um, pieces of paper, thinking there's something there that I can't quite pin down what it is. And we used to throw them away, which I now kind of like kicking myself. But anyway, uh, one time I was like, stop throwing these away. We know we need to keep them because there's something there. And so I, you know, at one point we put them up in the studio and I kept looking at them, kept looking at them and thinking, it feels really sculptural, you know, and how do I kind of bring that out into the kind of three-dimensional space? And that's when this body of work came up and I was looking at materials. I was looking at, um, you know, how one could kind of move around the space and, and how I could actually even make it work structurally or suspended. I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen. I tried it on the wall. I, you know, I tried various kind of things. I even tried kind of just leaving it on the floor and seeing how it grows. Um, but this has kind of been an exciting series of work that I've been really pushing as much as I can and still pushing. Um, the next slide um, is a body of work that I started actually when I was doing my residency in Bangkok in 2006. 
And um, it was a material that reflectors that I found in DIY stores. I love visiting DIY stores if I, wherever I am in the world because they're so interesting. You know, there are things that you'd find that, you know, kind of create this kind of common link between places. But then there are things that you'd find that are kind of strange and you think, why is it there? And it kind of makes you question a lot, you know. Um, so this is a series, an ongoing series that I've, been able to kind of explore a lot more recently and you know that's to do with you know as an artist you can't always have funding and money to be able to explore um, a body of work so you always kind of put it aside so after 2006 I put it aside until I think 2017 uh, when I was able to kind of do a pr proposal for a commission which was at King's Cross and that's when it kind of allowed me the time and space and money to explore that body of work. And so this is an installation which is part of the Dappled Light Show. Um, and it's at Mead where I was able to really um, kind of explore the kind of sculptural aspect of this work. And also, I just, I remember, um, you know, being in Washington and um, at the National Gallery and there was a space that showed Anne Truitt's work and I love her work. And there was this moment that I saw the Rothko room and then, you know, went to the opposite end of the building and walked up the stairs and saw um, Anne Truitt's work. And it, the way it was lit, it was just incredibly beautiful. They just felt really monumental. They're kind of, there was something about uh, these works and, and I was working on those, on this body of work at the same time. And it was just wonderful to have this kind of connection with an artist that you love and, you know, are inspired by. Um, and then this is a another series of work that stemmed from um, a body of work that I did, started off in Bangladesh, where I was using kind of natural and raw materials like bamboo um, baskets. And these baskets um, had these incredible structural um, uh, properties, which I hadn't anticipated until I was physically making the installation. And so when I came back to the studio, I was like, OK, I want to find a material that allows me to kind of really explore structure and form in a way that I hadn't done before, where it would allow me to kind of, um, you know, really walk through and see changes happening within the work. Um, and this was a fantastic opportunity to be able to kind of do something outdoors. And uh, so again, you know, change is constantly happening because the weather there is also quite dramatic and um, it's beautiful to kind of see it in different state as well and different in the different light as well. Um, and then the next work is a work that I'm currently kind of trying to push in the studio. They stem from a really early body of work, which um, I was doing, um, I can't remember the date now, but it's using hazard tape pieces, um, where I, I think I'd, I was kind of making work with hazard tape and resin, and resin was used to kind of really you know, I was thinking about stability and um, and it was at a time where I was doing a lot of research um, in color and it was starting to, the research on color was starting to kind of fade off and where it was starting to kind of really um, take a different direction and it was in including the, the early research which was about light and form. And so it was kind of bringing those two to things together and the hazard tape was a, a real um, kind of point of departure where it made me think about how to kind of be in the physical space and look at form and color in a, a slightly different way. And so it's really interesting where I was recently asked to do some prints with Christia Robert and that made me go back and look at certain series of work that I hadn't been able to push and thinking, well, how can I push that now? It's an opportunity to be able to push something that... Um, and so this is kind of bringing out some of those kind of elements that I was thinking about then 
and looking at it kind of in a three-dimensional way. Um, this is a, another series of work where um, it started off actually at Tate's and Ives, um, a residency I was doing there. And I've always been fascinated by this material, the fishing net. I've, um, you know, I grew up partly in Bangladesh and partly in the UK, but where I grew up in Bangladesh is in the countryside. And so I'm surrounded by water and rice fields. And so, you know, especially during kind of the period where it's flooded, you see these incredibly beautiful kind of bamboo structures with fishing nets. Um, and I've, I've just been kind of constantly drawn to them. And so when I was doing the residency in uh, St. Ives, I um, had the opportunity to interact and have conversation with um, people in the other studios. And the studios below me were kind of fishermen that had um, fishing net and floats and that they were working with. And so I was able to kind of use that time to really explore and play with this material. And since then, whenever there's an opportunity to kind of explore this series and push it. Um, so this is kind of the, its latest kind of iteration that I was really excited by because um, it's at Concrete, well, it's just finished now, the show, and it's a Rem Cool House building. It's this incredible, beautiful architecture, and it has this amazing height. And I was able to kind of really push this work uh, in a way that I hadn't done before. And so for me, it's a really exciting time with this work. Um, and then the next slide is um, the latest uh, work, uh, which is on show in Palm Springs, um, which is part of Desert X. Um, so this is quite... I don't know if the photo does justice, um, but uh, it's a lot of the, uh, when I did the site visit initially, um, I, I flew to LA and then drove from LA to Palm Springs. And that journey for me, is, it was incredible to kind of, I mean, I've been to LA before, but um, it was a while ago. But since kind of COVID, since, you know, everything that's been happening, kind of Brexit and Trump and all of these things, you know, it's like you really, I don't know, I feel like everyone else, really sensitive to what's going on around you. And and I really felt it, that journey from LA to Palm Springs and constantly seeing barriers, constantly seeing these kind of um, fences up and you think there's just so much space you know why is there a need for um you know so much barriers so much kind of um you know boundaries being set and so it kind of just stuck with me and the more i walked around i spent i think just over a week there and then the more i w walked around the more this material became more and more kind of um you know kind of shouting at me to kind of to be used um, and so this piece is something that you have to kind of walk into and as you walk into it feels kind of really claustrophobic you feel you know like there's only one way and you just have to keep going you can't really turn back but as you go in you know there's two layers of it that feels quite claustrophobic but as you go in it starts to open up and so you end up having a completely different experience of, of this work. So you have this initial experience where this kind of mountain-like form feels like a mirage. And, you know, it's kind of the color is kind of very similar to kind of the sand um, there. And it's kind of looking like a mountain. And then as you walk through, you have a completely different experience and of the work. Um, and then as you go into the middle, it's, it becomes open, it becomes freer, it becomes, you know, a, a, a form of kind of relief, release. And, you know, and I've been kind of really interested in how, um, you know, how you really experience form, material and color and, and its interaction with, you know, light. So, yeah, this is kind of where I am. Um, I'm going to start by talking about my work that's in the show. 
And um, it was really nice, actually, to revisit this. So it's a piece from 10 years ago. Um, and it has its origins a bit further back than that. Um, it's made from cast aluminium, um, lost wax cast aluminium, um, and some of which has been powder coated, and oak dowel. Um, and it's called Maxi Mini Midi Midi Midi. Um, titles and language are really important in my work. I see them as sculptural material as much as metal or fabric or crab shells or data, for example. Um, so thinking of the title of the exhibition, Breaking the Mold, um, this, exhibit, this work was made using silicon molds. I still can't make a two-part mold with a jacket, so I would make in the studio and I made for these in the studio. Just very, very simple silicon molds that are bendy. They kind of stretch and bend. And that means that when I fill them with wax, I can kind of stretch them and manipulate them. And that form of authorship, whereby I kind of carry on asserting authorship through a process, is really, really fruitful for me. Um, and I've been able to do that uh, with kind of more monumental casting more, more recently. But this was, was kind of the beginnings of that. Um, so it, this work began with a kind of a, a wrong or a misunderstood relationship to, to mold making and, and casting. Um, the form feels very stretched, so stretching is still really important in my work. Um, this is also a sculpture that is all edge, so it's all edges, it's all surface. We're, we're not looking here at solid forms, um, and I think that was really interesting as well about the work that Rana just talked about. Um, so edges and, and surface, especially the sculptural potential of surface, is super, super interesting to me. Um, and I think at the time I would also have described this piece as figurative but without a body. So um, it inhabits the wall and it treats the wall as a, as a body that wears the work. I was also thinking about these skirt lengths, so the, the, the casts were taken from the waistbands and the bottoms of skirts, kind of maxi skirts, mini skirts and midi skirts. And I was thinking about how those lengths rise and fall with cycles of consumption as well as with body organs. So the, the, the paired forms, I imagined them as um, lungs or as um, uh, pupils that might expand and contract. So I'm interested in the the intimacy with how those kind of power relations are interiorized kind of in a body. And I was thinking of skirts as gendered clothing and how binary gender has been both constructed and exploited by consumerism as a way of violently enforcing a narrow identity. So when I look at it now, I see that it, it works with all of this in a playful and a light way um, that I really appreciate in our heavy times. So, um, going from 2012 to now, this is an installation image of a, a show that's currently open at Milton Keynes Gallery. It's an exhibition called Trickster Figures, Sculpture and the Body, curated by Jess Fernie. And it's in its last month now, so I'd, I'd really recommend that if you're interested in sculpture, definitely see it. Um, I think sculpture has been a really conservative discipline, and this is why it's been an area that has been very fruitful for me to work in because I really want to kick against all of that. And this show tries to really explode it. It's a really thrilling show to be a part of. Um, and um, so my work opens the show um, and this is um, the first work that you see. It's called Soft Sediment Deformation, Iron Bodies. Um, and it's made from opal pleated inkjet prints on and in heavy crepe de chine. So what, what I was saying about surface being very fruitful for me and being a, a place with sculptural potential um, is something that I'm really working with in this work. This work also has an incredible economy. It travels very light. So when it arrives in a gallery, it's in some cardboard tubes um, that, that travel really easily. And then it unfurls and it stretches out to monumental proportions. And, and that kind of stretchiness is really fascinating to me. I would also describe it as a piece in which multiple scales and kinds of body are layered into a deep surface. So the image that has been printed onto this fabric is an image taken from a rock formation 
Um, it's a formation called the Crackington Formation on the North Devon coastline. Um, so that is the biggest planetary body that I can imagine. Um, and then I've layered that body, I've stretched it and then compressed it um, over the human scale of the industrial processes that are used to make clothing. So the printing process and the pleating process that I use to make this work layer those different scales and speeds and kind of time into it. I would describe it as an honest surface um, because of the way that it's glitched and broken, but also ecstatic. Um, so here's the next piece. Um, so this is a really important work for me. Um, it's from 2019, and it's called Planetary System, Colza DGK 63. Um, and again, what we're looking at here is a sculpture that isn't a solid form. So it's something with an, an, an empty center. And this dynamic in an object really fascinates me because when I look at something that isn't a solid form, I'm looking through it, which means that I'm look at, not looking at it, I'm looking with it. So that starts to break down those kind of simplified binary subject object relations into something much more complex. Um, and that was really, that's really fascinating as well, I think, in, in Rana's work. Um, so you can see here that what I've done is I've taken this machine um, from an industrial process. And this is a machine, if you have a car, um, this machine, your car headlamps will have been in a, a machine a lot like this. And they'll have been in there as kind of plastic. And then when they come out of the machine, they'll have been coated in a really thin layer of aluminium. But I retrofitted this machine so that I could put inside it, instead of multiple plastic parts, multiple um, fragile bodies. So I put all of these crab shells in it. So they're not cast, they're real. Um, they're actual crab shells. Um, and it, so it, it's part of a body of work that has probably since about 2016, I've been trying to take forms from industrial processes, tweak them slightly, and then show them as sculpture. And what interests me about that is that these forms are usually occulted. They're usually things, we, we usually see finished products. We don't see processes. So I'm trying to use sculpture as a place within which I might make those visible. Um, this also, to me, is a work that is very violent, um, but also very seductive. So I'm very much working with the awkwardness of that kind of material complicity. So the next piece I'm going to talk about is called Megaflora. Um, it's from 2021, um, and it's made with just one material, sand cast aluminium. So if we think back to the first piece, which is the piece that's in Breaking the Mold, I've been able to carry on working with casting, um, but I think what I've been trying to do is to expand the, the bodies and the, the, the kind of sense of the bodies that I'm working with. Um, this piece was made in 2021, so it was made remotely, and it was made at a foundry that I couldn't visit, um, but it was made with somebody that I had very, very good communication with. Um, and those relationships uh, kind of with people as well as with processes and, and materials are what really drive my work. Um, it's a monumental sculpture. It's a kind of vertical aluminium body. And it's made by taking a very small section of a very uh, kind of uh, peripheral plant, um, a bramble stem, which I made a scan of. Um, and then I stretched the scan to monumental proportions um, carved it using a, a CNC milling process from foam, and then the cast was taken from that. And this is a process that's often used to uh, make kind of large-scale sculpture, um, but the process is not usually visible. Um, and what I wanted to do in the skin of this work is to leave marks from all of those processes. So you can see marks from the sand casting process, and from the milling process, from the digital process. But then also you can see the hollowness inside the form. Um, so the casting is hollow. It was important for me to make this visible. It's a hollow body. Though, of course, in monumental figurative sculpture, this is usually hidden. What I when I found this out, it was mind-blowing. And it really opened the door to large-scale casting for me. It meant there was a job to be done to show that these bodies that usually stand above us are actually hollow. So this piece was made in 2021, 
And I was thinking about how the year before, um, after years of campaigning, um, the final toppling of the sculpture of the Tory slave trader Edward Colston in Bristol and other similar sculptures was relatively easy because these are hollow men. So these sculptures are usually hollow. And in this piece, I really wanted to reveal that. Um, but again, it's a really unusual one for me because it's so singular. I think generally my work is, is not so singular. So this is a much more recent work. Um, it's called a Dry Cask Tangerine. Um, and it shows forms that have been sliced open, um, revealing their interiors, interiors that are usually occulted. Um, and there's a lot of pleasure in this work for me. Um, there's, there's kind of particular references, um, but there's a lot of pleasure in the color, in the reflections. Um, but I would, very similarly to the planetary system work, the machine with the crab shells, I've tried to place a biological form, these castings, these aluminum castings of ammonites that I think of as chubby worms inside this industrial form. Um, and a work like this very much comes about through studio practice for me. It's something that can be made um, kind of much more intuitively than um, something that has to be made um, kind of uh, outside the studio kind of with, with more support so that those different ways of working are important. So this is um, a piece called Lethality and Vulnerability from 2021. Um, it's made from rolled aluminum tube, um, mirror polished, laser cut, folded and welded aluminum sheet. Um, and it was commissioned by Art Angel for a project at Orford Ness, um, which is a very strange ex-military site on the Suffolk coast. Um, and this was made very, very fast because I couldn't visit this site until early April 2021. Um, and by that point, I had about two months um, till the show opened. Um, and I had loads of ideas that I'd really worked up and I got to the site and real realized I was gonna rip them up and start again. So um, that kind of energy of having to make something like that um, was really great, I think. Um, so it's a response to a specific site um, but it's also, I would describe it as site responsive rather than site specific. In a way, it's a love letter to aluminium. Um, so uh, there's, there's lots of kind of ruined um, kind of 20th century relics at this site. There's a lot of crumbling concrete structures that we use to test weapons. Um, and there's a lot of ferrous metal rusting. And I really wanted to use aluminium there because it's so alien. Um, and I wanted it to, to be very alien to the site. It has this really weird glow. Um, it's a very 21st century metal. Um, and it was really important to me that it didn't age with the site at all. Um, and that's one of the reasons that this, this piece has now been recycled. So um, next time you're drinking from an aluminum drinks can, think of this piece. Um, and I wanted to say that because I think it's um, still a taboo to say that sculpture doesn't last forever. Um, and I think it's totally fine to recycle artworks um, and I, I, yeah art storage is another big taboo um, in the art world the amount of kind of accumulation senseless accumulation that it it runs on um, is one of the things that probably needs to be discussed at this moment in time um, so yeah loads of images of this I'm just going to finish with this piece which I really wanted to include because it's the same part of the California desert that um, Rana's in incredible mesh piece was in. So it, this is a work called Rock Pool. Um, it's from 2022. Um, it's the materials are two tons of locally extracted coarse salt, hand curved, powder coated and lacquered steel. And it was commissioned by High Desert Test Sites, a tiny organization run by the artist Andrea Zittel for an event curated by Ivona Blaswick. And it's a dry pool. I really wanted to make a dry pool. Um, I've made quite a lot of pools as sculptures over the years. Um, and it stretches across the desert surface. So again, there's that idea of stretching. Um, and so at this location in the Mojave Desert, you can see the mountains um, behind the piece. Um, but in the other direction, there is a, a salt mine, um, a salt extraction plant, um, which is 
also extremely beautiful um, and extremely disturbing. And I wanted to show that the desert was a kind of factory. You know, it looks like a sublime natural landscape, but um, it's been uh, a place of um, kind of extraction and human intervention, just like everywhere else. Um, so I would describe this, this rock pool as provocatively artificial as a sculpture. Um, yeah, that's it. Oh, there's, I'll just finish with this last one because I was... So this is a solo show. Um, it's called Worms, and it was a solo show from 2021. And I wanted to finish with this because I was thinking about how to go forward and um, how to go forward um, at sculptors and with sculpture. And this was the first show uh, that I made and my first time traveling abroad since Brexit and COVID. Um, and it was what I would describe as a suitcase show um, because everything in it, so the piece on the floor was something that I borrowed that was made in Turin, so it was made in Italy. Um, and then the other two pieces were small enough to pack down because the, so the, the fabric piece expands and contracts and to go in my suitcase. Um, I was thinking about borders and about scale, so I titled the show Worms after a supposedly tiny creature whose actions have huge consequences in the so-called human world and who does not recognize borders. Um, and it, it, for me, this show is about how to work, work in a way that is nimble and light on my feet. So I thought that was a good, good place to finish in the context of sculpture. Thanks. Thank you so much, both of you. That's fascinating. And I love the idea of being light and nimble because that's what we're about to be. But it strikes me that you are both working in such very different ways with very different outcomes. Yet at the heart of your practices lies an interest in exploring a formal language. Um, shape, color, light, weight, materiality. And as we can see in exhibition, this can have potentially limitless outcomes. So I wanted to start by asking you why formal concerns are such a driver for you. I think that's a really great question. Um, so this year, I went to art school. I started my BA at Goldsmiths 20 years ago. And I think the huge shift that's happened in art um, and in kind of other areas is away from language and to materials and processes and form. Um, and I think it's massive. And I remember being really interested in those things when I was at art school. It was 20 years ago that I started my BA at Goldsmiths. Nobody could talk about materials and about process and form. And I could see that that made the tutors really nervous, which was like, you know, the biggest green light for me. I thought, okay, this, this is the direction in which to go. And when I teach now, and when I see work that's being made in art schools now, I see there's been a, a huge change. So, um, yeah, that would be my way of beginning that. And I've also got an incredible quote from um, philosopher Rosie Bredotti, who says, if, if the only constant at the dawn of the 21st century is change, then the challenge lies in thinking about process rather than concepts. So, yeah. That's fascinating that you were at the cusp of that change in terms of your art education. Yeah, it's interesting kind of hearing that. Um, I mean, I was, I was really, when I was doing my degree and my master's, I was really into kind of process. And um, the tutors that I had were, um, you know, Gary Woodley, who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his work is kind of very minimal and, again, kind of very formal. But he, I learned so much from him uh, in terms of material process and how to kind of make things and how to kind of um, actually, you know, like think about each different kind of step of the way and from beginning to end. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of really interesting because I think, like you say, it's, it's kind of, you can talk about it, but you can't. It's, you just you're kind of left kind of really uncertain when I left university as well. Um, but I think you have to go with your kind of gut instinct. And I mean, this piece that you have up, um, the image of my work, um, you know, this is a body of work that I remember thinking, you know, I really want to push my work. I want to find 
um, other things that are happening, you know, things that kind of really excite me. And I remember making this work and then um, being really excited to show my galleries going, you know, I, I, I'm so excited that, you know, the direction is going. And they were like, oh, we can't sell this. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, I hadn't thought about, <laughs> you know, that. And I was like, but I can't, I don't want to be making the same work. You know, I want to be exploring. I want to be pushing myself. And, yeah, I think, you know, there is, there are moments where you'll find yourself kind of being pigeonholed or pushed into, um, you know, a certain kind of category. But both, you know, I mean, it's wonderful to kind of hear Alice. Uh, this is the first time I've heard you kind of talk about your work. So it's really, well, and I can really kind of relate to some of the things you're saying. Um, and it's just, both of us, you know, like I can, I get really excited seeing your work. The first time I saw Alice's work was in, um, was it the glass, large glass gallery? And I just remember being really excited and I was like, wow, you know, this artist is kind of really exploring material, look, really looking. You know, this is, this is the other thing, you know, it's about looking, looking at your surrounding, looking at kind of, you know, what's happening around you. And I felt like, you know, you're one of those artists that was really looking and seeing things that I, you know, I get really excited about as well. Yeah, and that brings me very neatly onto the next question, really, which is about your experience of the world, but also your, your engagement with the work. So you come to this formal language from a very bodily or embodied position. It's about your sensations, your responses to a space, to a particular experience, or maybe, Alice, your body in relation to other bodies, tiny worms, crabs, you know, your, your place in the world, really. So I wondered if you could respond to this idea of how you balance the formal with this very sensuous, bodily, figurative language. I, I think form is sensuous, um, and it, it's very mysterious. Um, it's also political. I think um, if I'd called myself a formalist at art school, I would have been laughed out of the room. But I think, you know, the moment you put an object in a room, you're kind of creating power relations. So, yeah, I, I definitely think form is, is sensual. Um, I think the, the question about embodiment for me is, is my body my body? And... Um, I'm, I'm as interested in disembodiment as I am in, 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 in embodiment, because um, I think that those two experiences are uh, very much kind of part of the world that we live in. Um, and yeah, just thinking about the work that's in this show that I began talking about and the journey that I've been on over the last decades, very broadly, you could say that what I've tried to do is to bring in kind of multiple other bodies other than and in addition to my own. One of the ways I've done that is by asking people to kind of write with me um, and make texts that accompany exhibitions. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that would be my answer to that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my work, uh, you know, the images really don't do justice. You have to physically be there. Um, and I think it's the same with Alice. Like, you have to physically um, see the work, physically move around the space to really take it in and take in the kind of the three-dimensional aspect of it. So I think the body kind of, you know, really matters. I mean, I remember a moment, actually, uh, I, I, there's another series of work that I've been working on, which is kind of fingerprint. And it started off because um, I had to go to Bangladesh because my father had left some land and donated and we had to sign. All my siblings had to go over and sign the papers, but it wasn't enough to sign. We had to then go to the registry office to put our thumbprint on the papers. And I remember that experience just being um, where I had goosebumps, basically. And the reason was that as I walked in, to this building, which was just two rooms with a kind of entrance space. Um, the entire 
wall of that space and going to the rooms was covered in fingerprints. And this was the first time where I felt this incredible connection with body, architecture, and land landscape. Yeah. And it just, it, I felt so moved by this kind of experience that I think, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't felt that before, you know. I think there, I'm constantly trying to kind of grasp moments with my work, moments that I think are, you know, that are quite fleeting, um, that I have, you know, where I'm living and working or where I'm traveling or, you know, um, you know, in the streets that you kind of get. And it is, it is very much about the body and, and scale and, um, change and shift that's happening in in your surrounding and yeah I don't know I feel like I veered off from <laughs> no not at all because I think relating to that and this is how it all seems to connect together you both talked about finding things and the power of found objects be it um for example you finding the fisherman and that amazing net which suddenly sets off this whole other chain of work but also You've worked with clothing, wheelie bins, fossils, all different kinds of found objects, and, and they've sparked a whole new series of works. And so I wondered if you could perhaps reflect, reflect on, on, the, on the lure of the found object, really, and how that can have so much opportunity for sculpture. I think, I think it's a really interesting phrase, isn't it? It's a bit like I wanted to go back and say, for me, it's really this phrase, the body, why would we always assume that the body means a human body? Um, and one of the, the big problems, for example, with something like minimalism is that it assumes that there is a single body, um, usually the body of the artist um, who's a vertical white man. Um, you know, this is a very normative body, um, and that's no help for anybody. So the task now is to just explode that um, and that's also why I included slides from Jess's show, which really thinks this, cat re as well as rethinking the category sculpture, um, rethinks the category the body. But when I also think about that phrase, found objects, they're never found. <laughs> because, um, yes, there might be a kind of process of, of chance, but then it's so specific. Um, I'm really interested in precision and then the complexity that can come from precision. So um, the crab shells that you saw in the, the images of the, the Peace Planetary System, for example, um, I went into that process because I was really fascinated by this process uh, of vacuum metallizing, which is where that piece of machinery comes from, partly because that process involves turning a metal into a vapor, um, which I thought uh, was fascinating and also the the power relations involved in turning what's supposed to be a kind of solid essential foundational material into a vapor and then that happening just not far from here so the, the factory where I first started working with with that is in Birmingham I've done loads of work with industrial processes in Birmingham I got really interested in the process found someone in a factory uh, in the outskirts of Birmingham who was curious as curious about me as I was about uh, the, the process in this factory and then found a way to kind of retrofit these crab shells that I'd also become interested in. So they, they definitely didn't feel found. Um, they, were, they were more something that I kind of, uh, kind of looked for. Um, but I think also the phrase found objects assumes that there are, there are other materials that are somehow not found and therefore come without associations as if something like steel or plaster or stone is kind of new in the world and to be sculpted. Well, actually they're not, you know, all of those materials come from places they, usually they've been kind of, yeah, all of those materials have characteristics that are kind of ripe for um, kind of being used as, as part of sculpture. So you could say that everything is within the category of found, even if that is the kind of uh, an inadequate word. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's, 
it's um, true. No, I think actually it's really interesting because it, it's true, it's by chance. I mean, the reflector works for me was like, again, by chance. The fingerprint series was again by chance. And I mean, it's there, you see it all the time. I think this is the thing that I get really excited about, like whether it's the reflectors or fishing net or the chain link for Desert X or fingerprint. It's there around us all the time and we see it all the time and it's just kind of there's a moment where things just connect and allow us to see things in a way that we hadn't seen before and make us question about the material and its kind of origin originality god now i can't talk and its function and i've been kind of really fascinated by you know, this kind of the functionality of some of the material that I use. I mean, I love, you know, I love architectural material. I love architecture. I've always been kind of inspired by architecture. And in fact, you know, I remember thinking I'd love to be an architect, but I was never good at math. Um, but, you know, I love kind of all the things that kind of come with it, you know, because it really makes you look at material in a way that you haven't looked at. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I, it's interesting for me in terms of materials and um, and the meaning that they have. I mean, it was interesting hearing Alice, what you know, how you title your work, you know, whereas I'm kind of so uh, removed, uh, you know, I like to kind of remove my name or my title. I, I want the viewer to be able to kind of experience the work and really, kind of delve into it and really see it and not be um, not be dictated or directed by, uh, you know, my own kind of um, perspective on it. So it's kind of, yeah, it's really, um, I've now veered off somewhere else. But no, I just bring, thinking back to materials, I was very intrigued by what you were saying, Alice, about not holding on to sculpture forever. And <laughs> it does feel like a pertinent question to ask this moment of scarce resources but what I'm also drawn to is is this this notion of ephemeral materials and Rana it feels like your work is becoming lighter more cloud-like softer it's rising off the ground almost like it's about to evaporate and similarly you've looked at smoke rings and cigarette ash and materials that are so really hard to to contain I guess and I wondered if what is this this flux? We've broken down these boundaries between the figurative and the found and the, and the formal, but, but, but I'm interested in how yourselves and many contemporary artists today are, are looking at this interest in flux, malleability, and whether you could comment on that. Again, kind of thinking back to when I was at college and also when I emerged as an artist, there was an idea that, um, and there were certain very prominent artists at the time who were talking about materials as dumb or mute. Um, and I remember thinking, that's so weird, that's so wrong. Um, it really didn't ring true um, to what I kind of sensed, but also what I was reading. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to think, to realize that, yeah, materials have agency um, and that you, I think solidity um, is not where you're going to find that. Um, and I think it's still really fascinating um, the way that um, there is, there's still a kind of value put on a solid sculpture um, that wouldn't be put, for example, on something that had to be hung from the ceiling. Um, and there's politics in that. Um, and yeah, I think it's really, really interesting really fertile territory to be working in. That's kind of really interesting. I've, I've, yeah, I mean, I, um, most of the time I don't really, um, I mean, give a crap in terms of like, you know, in terms of the value that people put in. I think for me, I've always been kind of interested in just kind of pushing the work. And it's so true, people do, um, and, I've, yeah, I've always kind of found, you know, there isn't a trend that I want to follow. There isn't, you know, even if 
the work isn't sellable, you know, I'm like, uh, this is not why I'm making, you know, the work. It's not necessarily to sell. But going to your question, um, I, I'm not just only interested in the kind of the ephemeral. I think more recently what I found is that I'm kind of going back into this period of research where it was about light and form. And I felt that it gave me kind of this, you know, at the time that I don't think I kind of really explored enough was this kind of sensitivity to material surface and the way the light kind of interacts. And a lot of the projects recently, I've been trying quite hard to move away from color. And I think <laughs> there's a label I've, I've attached to um, this label of kind of an artist that uses color. Um, and it's been difficult. So I'm exploring other avenues in the studio. It's like, okay, but even if I'm not showing work that you know doesn't have color, I'm exploring it in the studio and giving myself that space to kind of create and push. Um, but going back to your question about um, you know making works and that either last, you know the Desert X piece, you know. Uh, I know that there's a chance that this work might not have a home at the end of the day. But I think you you get you come round to it. You you come round because you you know there's a part of you that wants to explore, push the work, look at scale, look at ways of working that has less impact on the environment. You know, I like the fact that this can be dismantled and, you know, become something else and become someone else's kind of fence. I mean, I had someone on Instagram messaging me going, oh, wow, this work is amazing, it's incredible. And, um, you know, I love it. You know, what material did you use? And then the next question was like, yeah, you know, where did you get it? I, you know, I need to kind of do my fencing. <laughs> so I was like, I'm glad that I've become, you know, the Google for fencing. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it, it's really, it, it's good because it means that you could do these kind of ambitious projects and not be stressed about, okay, I have to find a home for it. I have to figure out how it's going to, or I, you know, like you can't work and especially the pandemic has kind of opened up doors in a way that you hadn't been able to do before you know everyone was determined that you have to fly you have to be able to do these projects by going over there physically actually you don't you know since the pandemic I've been able to kind of work in various ways and I love it I love the fact that I can work with people remotely and do projects that don't necessarily have to have a long life you know like, uh. I could go in so many different directions now but maybe I've just got a couple more before we end and that's about hands off and hands on because you work on this incredible scale in the desert on a huge monumental scale but also in an intimate way where you've both spoken about the importance of time in your studio just thinking ideas through I mean how do you balance your life? You're thinking, working with contractors, working on very large public projects, but also working on in a hands-on, intimate way. Is, is, that, is that something that, that you love, or is that something that can be quite challenging, finding time to devote to that, that, that interface, really, between those poles? It can, but I think I just really welcome different ways of working, and if I can get the kind of uh, the people and the resources to make something really big um, as, as part of a commission or a project, then I'll really go for it. Um, but that is often informed by the much more experimental work that I can do in the studio. And um, so it's really important for me to have both. And I feel like I'm many different people and I think as an artist, you have to be so many different people. And maybe I'm many different artists. Um, and, and to have that kind of hands-on, hands-off. I think for me, that also really connects to this idea of embodiment and disembodiment that I get from working with both kind of organic and industrial forms, processes, materials that really fascinates me and that I keep coming back to. But um, 
Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've been really um, struggling um, with it being more hands-on. I really miss it. And so actually I've, um, you know, I've started doing residencies where I'm away from the studio, away from kind of demands, and where I'm really allowed to kind of make mistakes and play around and really work with my hand. And actually I do a lot of residencies with my kids and they really force me to kind of come out of my shell and look at things in a way that I don't. And it does, in the studio, it can become quite formal and everything becomes quite, you know, about straight edges and becoming, you know, very clean, very minimal. Um, but yeah, I I love, I mean, I have, uh, I have a studio at home as well, which I can kind of set up and work on my own, but I, it's it's really difficult now it's becoming more and more difficult to kind of physically make work. Um, and I love having opportunities to make really small works, <laughs> you know, like making little models. I remember for, I think it was for Pallant House, we had to make little models of, um, uh, you know, works that we're doing. And it was amazing to kind of see this tiny little window that I made um, that went into a model and um, to see it in that scale. And then, I love making larger scales and that it's the larger scale projects that I really want to be hands on and with as well. And it's really difficult. Like the desert Techs, they were like, no, 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 we've got the team. You don't need to come and visit. You just need to turn up at the opening. And it was really strange for me. Um, you know, I'm, I really struggled to let go and say, okay, here it is, here's a drawing, and you know, you make it. I, I really can't do that. Um, and I like to be involved, I like to, you know, kind of physically work with the material. So actually, when I did the proposal, we just did so many tests in the studio, we played around with the material, I physically kind of handled the material, so I can really kind of see, you know, the potential of that material as well. So yeah, it kind of varies from project to project, but I think both of us actually, you know, when you look at our work, because of the way the viewer has to kind of, whether it, they have to interact or even look or kind of, um, in some cases, be able to touch, I think there's a sensitivity and you can't get that without, you know, you physically being, you know, handling the material on your own as well. Um, but yes, I do spend a lot of my time in front of the computer writing emails, <laughs> which takes me forever. So, yeah, absolutely. Before we open the conversation to the floor, I just got one final question, which is perhaps coming back right to the exhibition and, and to this idea of conversations across time. You were talking about talking with your kids and thinking about generations. And I'm sure many here um, we're very sorry to hear of the sad passing of Phila DiBarlo. And it brings me back to a conversation I had when we installed the first show at Longside Gallery. And she popped into the gallery one day before the show opened to look at the show and looked around all the works and was just really thrilled by seeing all these amazing works that she clearly loved. And she said that the exhibition felt uncharted, that it felt so fresh. She was just really excited to see this conversation taking place. And I wondered if perhaps you might have a memory to share or, or an artist in the show that's inspired you and has really helped give you the, the sort of confidence, really, to break the mould. Is there, would, would, would there be a filler memory, perhaps, or perhaps another artist that's represented in the show or in the collection that's had a significant impact on your direction? Well, seeing the show um, today, I got that big that rush of adrenaline walking into the room and seeing my work on the wall and Veronica Ryan's piece on the floor in front of it. That was a real thrill. Um, there is one other artist in the show who's really important to me and that's Alison Wilding. Um, I think her work and particularly the way that the results that she gets from industrial processes are really fascinating. Um, but also the way she is and the way she um, kind of conducts herself um, I think it's really important to have people like that, um, you know, thinking about kind of going forward and 
you know, the prize is to carry on working for decades. I'm very early in my career still, um, but you need, um, you know, people to look to to go forward. And it's actually quite hard to make connections um, to artists um, from other generations. Yeah. So, yeah, she's someone that I'm really grateful for and, um, yeah, always in awe of her work and especially the way she gets such incredible sort of weirdly emotional results from industrial processes. You know, I know that that kind of work is really hard one and I really admire it. Don't think there's anything else quite like it. Yeah, and that spirit of taking risks across decades, I think yeah, is a really important Yeah, still being lesson. experimental. Yeah. So your question about studio practice, the reason that studio practice is really important is that I can be experimental there in a way that I can't, um, on a larger scale project, everything has to be decided in advance, but um, or working in a, an industrial setting, although I'll try to kind of push that in there. The risks I can really take to be experimental are in the studio, and um, I know that being experimental is something that I want to carry carry forward um, as I supposedly mature as an artist. We'll see. <laughs> Yeah, I remember having a tutorial actually with Billy Dabala. I was really, I was shocked, and I think that I think that was my kind of initial reaction, um, because you know I I see her, I bump into her, and obviously at the Royal Academy, and she lives quite nearby as well. So it was a bit of a shock, and for me, I felt quite overwhelmed by you know all the kind of images on social media and I think I just really struggled you know she's a hu she's had a huge impact on everyone that she's taught you know I I do remember my ex who you know had loads of tutors and I remember him talking really fondly of Philida and the tutorials that he's had so it's it's really sad to hear um about Philida and she's definitely someone that kind of inspired me and te definitely in terms of like exploring material and pushing boundaries um she's definitely one of those artists I mean the other artists again like Alison Wilding who I got to know a bit more through working on the summer exhibition and I've just I've loved her work for so long so it was amazing to be able to kind of connect with her and see how she works and she has the things as well um and the for me uh, I guess Tess Duray would be, you know, my mentor. Um, she was an artist that I um, love the work of and, and, and someone I discovered during my degree. And I actually applied to the Slade to do my master's because she was teaching there. And fortunately, when I, um, when I got onto the course, she had retired. So, but you could select a couple of artists to come in and uh, one was uh, Shirazi Hushiari and the other was Tess Jurey. and I remember just immediately having this connection with Tess Jurey, and she offered me a job there <laughs> as, a, as an assistant and so I worked for Tess for about five years and um, and yeah I mean I, I, I just really look up to her in terms of how she's kind of really pushes her work, pushes you know herself uh, as a human being you know and and just yeah it, it's just yeah thank you so much and here's to philida allison tess and all the artists in the exhibition thank you so much indeed thank you. <laughs> i think we could we could have gone on for a while longer but do we have any questions at all from the floor I, I just want to, for both of you, and thank you so much for that because it's absolutely fascinating and it was brilliant to kind of, you know, have your wonderful works in the show but being able to catch up with where you are now with your practice. Um, what's it like coming to a gallery and seeing like your older work on show because it's not you right now and obviously there's a particular, particular context to showing this work but, you know, how does it make you feel to see kind of older works that might not be quite where you're at at the moment with your practice? It's really, it's, it's really, like Alice is saying, it's so amazing to kind of see it, especially when you haven't, sorry, um, especially when you haven't seen it for a while. Um, it's great. And I think the best part for me was kind of seeing it in relationship to other artists in the space, you know, again, you know, to have the work um, alongside kind of Alison Wilding and Philly Barlow, it makes a massive difference. And to 
see the kind of the conversations that the works are having, you know, and like actually the first work I saw was kind of Rachel Whitehead's and the light was coming in, you know, flooding in into the space, natural light, and you see her work and um, and the light and then you kind of, your eyes kind of, you know, follow the space around and it's it's great, it's beautifully curated and I love the fact that there's natural light in the space and it's so wonderful to kind of see the work kind of interacting with the other works as well. That's a really great question. So I, it's always a little bit stomach churning because you don't know how well your work will have been installed and my work really depends on being installed in a particular way. And the great thing about the Arts Council collection is they take really good care of work and they always install it really well. And that is such a relief for me. Um, but that thing about, I'm, so I'm working at the moment on a survey show that opens in Switzerland on the 1st of July, and it's the first time that I've been show, that I'll show a lot of, it's the first big show that I've made that doesn't consist of entirely new work. It's work from the last sort of 12 years. And my big hope for that show, and I don't know whether this will be possible or not, is that I'll be able to see my work maybe for what it is, because usually it kind of comes together it's very rare for me to have a finished work in the studio. It does happen occasionally. Usually it comes together in the heat of an installation and I can never usually really see things. So today to walk into that room and to see that piece and to, to look at it slightly objectively was really interesting. And then as uh, Rana was saying, to see it in relation to others' work, for example, this incredible organic form of, of Veronica Ryan's, which I can't get enough of that piece. And to relate that to the much more industrial forms, but still with this kind of weird objection um, th that I have kind of hanging on the wall behind it was pretty thrilling. You know, I love those encounters with sculpture, you know, and I can't believe it. I feel like the luckiest person in the world to walk into that show today and for my work to be there. So yeah, thanks everyone that made that possible. <laughs> Any last questions at all? Yeah. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about instinct and selection in relation to your processes. Um, God, it, it really varies from project to project to series to series. Um, you know, sometimes it might be that something that I see when I'm out and about and something just connects and you're like, I, you know, I remember this or I remember something like this happening before or you see an interaction of kind of color and light and you're like, how do I, how do I capture that? And you're trying to photograph and video, take videos while you're driving and your kids are screaming going, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, so you have these moments um, and then you go back to the studio and sometimes it won't happen for a while and you can't connect to that moment that you have. Um, and you just kind of play around and, you know, there are moments where, like, you know, writer's block, you get that. And I, for something like that, I just really like to kind of delve in and just be hands-on. Um, my daughter gives out kind of relationship advice and she said the best thing to do is to work with your hands with the someone that you care about and you know and that's kind of <laughs> she was like five when when she gave that advice and um, you know and it just really stuck with me because I you know I love working with my hand and obviously she's kind of seen it and and has it <laughs> as well um, so those are kind of really important moments um I'm a bit more fortunate than Alice. I like to have the works up in the studio for a little bit for me to be able to see. And yeah, I know. I know. I I kind of demand that. And I was like, no, no, I need to. We work slightly ahead of schedule. We like to work slightly ahead of schedule so that we can kind of like see things and see how they come together and and basically kind of foresee any problems that might come up in terms of hanging or installing. So the process is very different from project to project. Like the cloud piece, you know, I made like a small version of it in the studio. Actually, I started off making a little model um, and I was thinking, oh, this is really interesting. And then I was like, what happens if I make it slightly bigger? And it just got even more interesting. And then I was like, okay, you know, 
let's just go ahead and make a huge one, see what happens. And I just got so excited. And I remember like sending it out images to various people that, you know, it's like, oh my God, look how exciting this is. Um, and, you know, I sent it to galleries as well. And I, I remember getting, oh, okay, it's interesting, you know, <laughs> and just thinking, oh, no one's really, you know, excited about this. Um, but I, I have these moments in the studio where I get very excited and I want to be just, you know, I could forget about eating, sleeping and just make basically. So, yeah. I think for me, so a lot of the processes that I've been working with are things that have really fascinated me because I, and I talked a bit about it, uh, because they're occulted. So, you know, I don't, when I look at a car headlamp, it seems like a kind of complete, um, kind of complete and mysterious thing, but I now know how the inside of a car headlamp has that metallic sheen, and it's because I've been to the factory in Birmingham, not so far from here, and worked with them over the years in order to make sculptures. So a lot of... And it, it, wanting to work with that process comes from a, a big drive to kind of make those processes visible because we're presented all the time in a consumerist society by finished products, you know, things that are completely kind of contained and what I want to know is where do they come from how can and how can I make that visible through sculpture so um but it there has to be a kind of initial seduction or fascination so with that one it was kind of metal is turned into a vapor in a factory outside Birmingham can I go there <laughs> um there's a big new work that I'm making for the survey show in Switzerland and it's to do with the part of a there's a part of a car factory where ostrich feathers, this organic material, are used to clean car bodies. Um, and I found that out going on a tour around the Jaguar Land Rover factory, on, on just also just outside Birmingham. But I couldn't see that part of the factory, so I started researching it. Again, it was to do with something that I couldn't see. Um, and over the years, I've kind of worked out a way to kind of get these parts and kind of make them, to make them visible. So yeah, it comes from one finding a process, not being able to see it, not being able to access it, and finding a way to do that kind of through sculpture. Thank you. Maybe one more, any more questions? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's one at the back. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, I think it was Alice that mentioned about sculptures, kind of when they're suspended compared to being like a solid sculpture and how they're treated differently. Um, I just kind of was curious about that, because I'm working on some sculptures myself, and I was planning on suspending them, and now I'm like, oh. Yeah. I think it's just, if something isn't um, complete when you take it out the box, there's much more work to be done in order to show it, for example. Um, and, um, you know, that work has to be done well, and it's it's part of my work as an artist to make sure that is done well. Um, but I think there's also a value judgment. Um, and I don't just mean um, the, the monetary value assigned to something, um, a, val a value given to individualistic forms that can kind of stand on their own. Whereas if you're making something that is m multiple um, or needs support in some way, I think that challenges all our, you know, the ideas about kind of individual selfhood. For example, I've made single sculptures that are made of multiple elements and people persist in calling them installations. It's been very, very important for me to say, no, this is a sculpture and it's to do with taking that category and expanding it. Um, and it's very important that we do that because the expanding that category means expanding ourselves um, and our relationship to the world that we're not separate from, but kind of completely Im enmeshed within, so. Do you think it's maybe because there are certain materials that have this, um, you know, temporary kind of feel to it or something that doesn't kind of maybe d won't last, not necessarily to do with kind of solidity or uh, it being ephemeral but more that when it's 
lots of different things that come together. I mean, this is where I feel like, you know, Phila de Barlo has really kind of pushed boundaries because, you know, she's kind of really using materials that really kind of come together in a way that you wouldn't think about. Um, do you think that maybe that has a impact on how people kind of value the work? Yeah, I mean, definitely if, thing, if things don't last, you know, that was why I said that that sculpture has been recycled and turned into drinks cans because that is, you know, sculpture's supposed to last forever, isn't it? And if it doesn't, what have you achieved? Well, I want to make something that's honest. Um, yeah. I think that's a really lovely place to bring this conversation together. Can we put our hands together for Rana and Alice?